Welcome to the Chip Happens Podcast, a podcast about construction, education, and everything in between. I am your host, Joseph Garibaldi, and I invite you to take a listen to a new and exciting podcast about construction and teaching. Thank you, guys. Welcome back to the Chip Happens Podcast. I'm really pumped to be here today, episode eight. I originally I was going to talk about budgets today, but I don't know. It's kind of boring. I really wasn't in the mood to put any of you to sleep. Maybe if you're listening to this at night, that would have been a good conversation. But right now, it is currently 8.21. 1 a.m. So we're going to talk about something else, something that's been kind of weighing on me. I was at a meeting yesterday and we did a little roundtable discussion and I was asked, one, how is the year going? And two, what are your struggles? What are your successes? So the year's going great. It's not exactly how I want it to be at all. It's very difficult, but it's a good difficult. It's not a hard or bad difficult. It's, it's actually pretty good. So, you know, it's challenged me as an educator. It's challenged me as a person. It's extremely lonely. I can't imagine how my kids feel and I, I feel for them deeply. But I've learned so much about myself. I've learned so much about my teaching and about my style that I've never really looked at before. So I'm extremely grateful for this opportunity and extremely grateful for this time. Yes, it's horrible and people are losing their lives and there is a a horrible sickness going around. But I'm also, you know, trying to look at positives. And I I think I am grateful for the time I get to develop my curriculum like this. And I think this is a very useful time to really sit back, reflect, and develop things. But that's not what I want to talk about. I was asked some things that are going well. And I listened to a couple other teachers say they're struggling with engaging students, building that community and that connection. The school I teach at is very unique, and it's one of the reasons why I really wanted to work here. Every student has to be in a pathway, a career pathway, a set of classes of three to four years that teaches a skill they can hopefully use at home or in a career. That being said, I was extremely pumped to be offered the job. I I accepted it right away. I only applied at two schools, and this is the only school. I interviewed at, and I knew right away this is something I wanted to do and something I wanted to pursue. When the pandemic hit, when COVID-19 hit, I was kind of turned upside down in how I look at things and how I view teaching. Originally in the summer, we were told we were going to go back in like a hybrid model, and so I had to kind of really rack my brain around that. And then everything started getting pushed back a little bit, you know, oh, we weren't going to have this conversation yet, we're going to wait a week, we're going to wait a week. And that's when I kind of realized that we were probably not going to go back. So I shifted my entire thinking from high hybrid, you know, online, offline to just online. And I don't know if I was one of the first to really start shifting or or just start to abandon that, you know, we're not going back to school right away thought. I don't claim to be, but I like to think I was. So what I did was I developed or I started developing online lessons and some were failures and some were successes, but I really looked at what my class was in general. My class is a shop class. It's a hands-on class, but what do my kids come to my class for? Okay. They come to build project. They come to be in the shop. So they don't come to be in the classroom at all. So I decided that I wasn't going to have them air quotations in the classroom as often. So I developed a work log and that sort of thing. But then I really had to think about something else. A lot of kids take my class because they like to hear my stories and how I relate what we're learning to their real life. If they couldn't hear my stories, they were not going to understand some of the concepts in the class. Just like I was taught construction, tile work, that sort of thing from my dad and my grandpa, I had to teach my students the same way that I learned it. That was the best way for me to learn it. And I know it's not necessarily the best way for students to learn it, but it'll help. It's a different way to kind of look at things and a different way to uh, teach. And my dad would always tell things through stories. You had to really listen to the story to figure out what his main idea was or what he was trying to tell you was. So that's how I kind of teach. I teach the same way. I tell stories, we talk about them, we laugh about them, but there's always some sort of moral to that story, right? It's not just a blank story that's just there. There's always some sort of moral that relates to it. That's why I'm taking the time to tell the story. How are my students going to get that at home? Yeah, we do Google Meets, we do Zooms, that sort of thing, but it's not the same. So how do I get it the same? Well, I love YouTube videos. I'm a millennial. I grew up and I remember in eighth grade, I got my first YouTube account. Not really account, but kind of channel. I signed up for YouTube. I watched YouTube all the time. I loved YouTube. I still love YouTube. I think that's the pinnacle of creation right now is YouTube. And there's slowly things starting to come and go, but it's always been YouTube. If we look at like TikTok right now, TikTok is a huge thing that Gen Z is loving. But the problem with TikTok is just the same problem that Vine had. If you remember Vine, Vine was trying to take over YouTube. But the problem with Vine is, is that as people developed their story skill, they could not push the limits of Vine because Vine was like the Twitter of video. You can only do maybe 
I don't know, 10 seconds, 15 seconds of video. TikTok is, I think, like a minute now. But even then, you can't really tell a good story in TikTok. I mean, you have to do parts. So YouTube will always be king right now in terms of video production, in terms of anyone can start a YouTube channel and start producing things for it. I decided that I was going to tune into my inner eighth grade freshman year self and start another YouTube channel. I, I've already closed all my ones down. I, I tried, like every kid back then, I tried a, a gaming channel, all this stuff. But I really, I took everything down, redid everything, and started to develop a channel focused on teaching kids. Oh, I gotta turn my volume off of my computer. So that being said, I started making content because that's what kids need. Kids need content. They need a, I don't know how to say it, they need a connection to the class, even if they're at home. So I focused on making videos. I filmed myself working in the shop, just normal stuff that I do in the shop, cleaning, you know, if I have random projects that come in that I need to finish for people, I, I film it and I, I call my shop series. I do quick tips. I do safety tips. I do a lot of different things because these kids need some sort of connection. And they're actually kind of popular. I mean, let me let me go to YouTube right now on the computer in front of me and we can look at what I, we can look at the, uh, let me go real quick. We can look at the subscriber counts. I mean, I started with zero subscribers. I have 43 right now. My most viewed video is a shower repair that I did at home with 335 views. And I know that's not a lot. It's definitely not a lot, but understand my second most popular video has 75 views. It's my shop tour, a tour I did in the shop and kind of the tools I have, that sort of thing. I also built a deck on here. I did questions for another teacher on machinery management. That's on my YouTube channel. I have a department intro that I filmed. It's sort of a catch-all for my class. If you want to see what my class is like, go to the YouTube channel and you can see exactly what my class is like. There is no hiding it. There's really nothing. You can see exactly what or exactly how I lay out my class and you can learn a little bit about me. You can learn a little bit about the class and that's kind of the, the main goal of the YouTube. But I decided to branch out from YouTube and incorporate that in my class. Kids like YouTube videos. We already know this. They That's their form of media that they like. They like TikTok videos. So how can I make my class like a real life YouTube video that's still teaching them something? The cool part is, is that I can join my Google Meet on my cell phone and I do it pretty regularly, maybe once, twice a week. There's going to be more times as I start getting out into the shop building things. And I take kids out into the shop like a real life vlog YouTube video. I sound like, I sound so old saying this, but we go into the shop and we do things, right? They're watching me on their computer screen like a real life YouTube video. They can give me feedback, tell me what to do, leave comments in the chat. I go through it and I sort through those comments and it's actually super useful because they get out into the shop. I get out into the shop. We build things together. They are able to give me comments. I'm able to show them exactly what I'm talking about in class. So I talk about a concept. I can show them the concept just like I would do in real life, except the only thing they can't do is practice the concept. And I think that's the uh, the hard part there is that they won't be able to practice that concept. But th that's really the only negative, I guess, is not being able to practice that concept. But they're able to get relatively close, you know? They're, I think the hardest part and the part that I personally struggle with is that I need them to interact more or I want them to interact more because I want to know what they're thinking. I want to know how my students are, how my students are doing, really. I want to know how, how is their mental standpoint? Are they okay? Kids go through so much stuff and we have, you know, we, we do have some idea because, you know, if you're listening to this, you were or if not are or going to be, you know, a teenager. We know the stuff they go through. We know the struggles. We know the emotional changes that they go through. And to do that alone, to do that alone is, is horrible. I could not imagine doing that alone, right? Going through those emotional changes alone. And yeah, as a teenager, I was like, I'm all alone in this, you know, like you're, you feel like you're alone, but you're really not. You're going to school, you're around people, you are, you are around your peers that are going through the same thing. You get to see the same reactions. So yes, while my lessons are kind of geared like a real life YouTube video, I needed more ways to connect to it. So I started uh, Instagram, right? Post things I'm doing, post uh, quick little updates, post pictures of projects I'm building, post things that they can relate to. You know, if we are doing something like a spirit day with the school, I'll post pictures of myself participating in those spirit days. I think that's so important, by the way, too. You need to participate. If you're a teacher, dress up for the kids. You're not better than them. Dress up for them. They like to see that stuff. The most interaction I get comes from me participating in those dress up days. Dress up for the kids. 
I don't care if you don't like pink. I don't care if you don't wear, you know, pajamas. You you wear something else. For one day, you can break the rules and step out of your comfort zone and dress up for these kids. They deserve that. Now, thank you for coming to my TED Talk. I'll post my dress up days and me dressing up on Instagram and I get a lot of interaction from that too. A lot of kids love that. Also, I've branched out in other directions as well. I downloaded and started using TikTok. And TikTok is a weird animal, man. I used to do Vine and then I remember when my little cousin, she's like 16 now, but when she was like 10 or 11, they had this thing called Musical.ly. You may remember Musical.ly. It's just like TikTok, except it's more like lip syncing and doing like stupid dances. But Musical.ly was a cool thing. It wasn't really as big as TikTok because when TikTok came, you were able to use any sort of sounds. You were, it was just like Vine. It, it, just like Vine, but with a little bit longer of a time frame that you're allowed to do things, which is kind of weird. Kind of weird to say that Vine was or mentioned Vine anymore. But I downloaded TikTok and I've learned things real quick. I mean, I've had a couple videos get about 2,000 views. I average about 500, 600 views a video, which is not a lot in TikTok space. But I always try to make it very low stakes and very uh, kind of maybe stupid. I don't know. There's one video I did that was really popular that everyone loved. It was to the song Hurricane by Luke Combs. And instead of like a girl walking into the shop, because I have a lot of boys in my shop, a lot of girls too, and they, like every high school relationship, there's breakups and stuff. And I can see it one time and I got inspiration from this because I distinctly remember a kid working in the shop and his like girlfriend or ex-girlfriend came in the shop to like, she was a TA for the office or something to hand me like, I don't know, it was a kid that needed to be go up to the front office for something. But I'll never forget the look on his face when she like walked in and it literally hit him like a hurricane. So I have, uh, I made a video where it was that song and I had two drills around me. I was using a Milwaukee drill. I had like a, a DeWalt laying next to me. And I have a Makita drill that I always use. I always use a Makita drill. If you listen to the last few podcasts, you know that I love Makita. And so I was drilling a, a screw into two pieces of wood and the song goes and then she strolled in and then it, the, the camera cuts to the Makita drill and then it cuts back to me and I drop the tool that I'm using and the Makita drill goes, cuts back back to the Makia drill. The Makia drill is going out the door and I start freaking out and like pushing everything off the table trying to get the uh, Makia drill back in my life and uh, it cuts one last to the door closing. It was probably one of my greater moments of just sheer, I don't know, um, creativity. I, I guess you would call it creativity. But it was really fun to record, and it was super fun to put the video out and see it do as well as it did when I just, I didn't expect it to get as much uh, likes. And then when I was in class, the next time I saw the kids, all they could talk about is the video and how funny it was and how much they enjoyed it. Uh, another video I just recently did, it was to Michael Jackson's Beat It, and I was going over demolition in class and how to effectively demo things in a safe way. Which, by the way, demo demolition is a real talent. If you are in the business of of demolishing things, you have the most talent possible. Because on the outside, it looks like you're just wrecking things. It looks like you are doing it uh, without any sort of reason or without any sort of plan. But there's a lot of plans to make sure, especially if you're doing a building, that the building doesn't just fall on top of you. You have to take things down in a particular way. So if you watch the TikTok, it may just look like that I'm using a crowbar to whale at this table. And well, yes, that's true. But understand, I am hitting the top, completely removing the top of the TV stand. Then I remove the sides and I work from my outside in so it minimizes, one, minimizes the mess and also minimizes any sort of debris that happens. So understand, while it looked like I was just going crazy on a TV stand, there was always a reason for how I broke up things. That being said, I did it to the song Michael Jackson's Beat It. It was extremely fun and I had a great time making that video. You know, and so it's it's just fun. They're low stakes. I'm not trying to become TikTok famous like some of the teachers joke about. I'm not trying to become YouTube famous. I'm not trying to do any of that stuff. I don't care. My videos can get two views or they can get 5,000 views. That doesn't matter to me. What matters to me is I'm giving my kids content and something to look forward to. And I don't think I'm going to stop making them. Even if we go back to school, I think they're very useful. Yes, they take up a ton of time, but I think they're tremendously useful. And I think the kids kind of deserve having some sort of connection to the shop if they if they want it. Or if they want connection, if they miss you know school and they want to see what school 
school is like, why not give them what school is like? Why not give them some some projects that they can, or some, some videos that they can relate to? So if I can offer some tips, if you ever want to start something, first off, make it relatable and make it something you enjoy doing. If you don't physically enjoy it, then it's not going to, it's not going to work. If you don't physically enjoy making the video, then it's not going to be a good video. I've scrapped videos. I've scrapped podcasts because I don't enjoy making them. In fact, I'm supposed to be talking about budgets, right? But I, I scrap the idea or push the idea off until I can find a way that would make me enjoy talking about creating a budget. It's a very important skill and I do really want to talk about that. But when it comes down to creating things, when it comes down to making things for students, make sure you enjoy it first. That's why I can recommend first and foremost. If you don't enjoy it, then your students won't enjoy it. When it comes down to making TikToks, I didn't know how to use it and TikTok makes it kind of easy, but also kind of frustrating. If you have the music auto sync to your clips, it cuts your clips like a ton. Like I filmed the 30 second clip and it cut my clip to like three seconds. So I had to like really go back and edit it. What I can recommend for TikTok, film your videos first on your phone and then import them into TikTok. Unless you already know what you want to do and what song you want to do, then you can record it straight on TikTok. But I've had a way more success in videos of the ones that I record like just on my phone uh, and then import them into TikTok. It was a way better process. For YouTube, if you are going into YouTube and trying to make money, you're not going to, right? You're, you're not going to create an audience quick enough. You're going to get tired of it. I mean, I've tried doing that at least three different times because in college and stuff, I'm like, I'm going to be, I'm going to be a YouTube famous. I won't have to pay for anything. I won't have to work. It's, it's hard work. I've posted a ton of videos so far and I don't even, I don't even have a whole lot of subscribers. I may not for a long time until like I hit a video that happens to really stick with people and that they share out. But that's not what I'm looking for. I'm looking to create things that students would relate to. I'm looking to create things I don't necessarily see and that I need and that I want to teach the students. For example, I created four videos about measurements and how to find area or find square footage. While they didn't view a lot, they gave my students a reference to look at. If students wanted to see how to do a particular thing or see how to do a particular measurement for an assignment, then they were going on the measurements video and watching it because I wasn't there. I was at home doing whatever. So when it comes down to videos, when it comes down to creation, do it for you. If you don't want to develop or not develop, but if you don't want to spend the time to do it, then don't do it. Find something else. I think the easiest way to get into contacting students or not contacting, but connecting with students is the first start Instagram. I think that was the easiest way for me just to really get my feet wet and figure it out is to start my Instagram account and kind of figure out a little bit about what I wanted to do with that. I had my Instagram for about a year before I started YouTube and I started YouTube over the summer and I started YouTube for the sheer purpose of just trying to get lessons out the kids. I kind of morphed my YouTube channel though. It, it Yeah, I do put lessons on there, but it's more of, you know, me filming things that I enjoy doing and that I see a lot of mistakes that kids make and I know that there are other people that make the same mistakes and so I want to help out those other people and my students. So I'll record a video about how to correct those mistakes. There's a lot of stuff I have done. I filmed uh, a coffee bar that I've built and I've built for other teachers. I filmed projects like a push stick. I filmed a lot of different things. That being said, your first few videos are going to be very rough. Just like your first podcast. My first podcast sucks. I'll be the first to admit it. It's very, uh, how do I say it? horrible because I, I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't understand how to do a podcast. Now I understand, like I get it. And maybe I should just do a whole, I think I'm gonna do a whole nother video about how to start a podcast and what the process was like for me and my, where I was at mentally or, or skill wise with starting a podcast because I thought I knew a lot, but I didn't. And that's a whole nother episode. But if I want to give you guys some tips and tricks, or as one of my teaching partners says, some ticks and trip tricks, I, I don't know, she's trying to make a play on words on TikTok and I gave her a pity laugh and we'll see if she listens this far on this. And if she does, I hope uh, she, I don't think she's going to listen this far to be honest with you, but she might, who knows? But kids get excited about this stuff. And that's why I want to leave you on is that kids get really pumped up that you are building or creating things for them. I remember I mentioned to the first time that I have a podcast. I had a student who is one of my best students. I can rely on this kid to do anything for me. And he is truly incredible and going to shape up to be a, a fine young man. And he's like, gee, we should start a podcast together. And I said, hey, man, I'm down. If you have an idea, you know, if you want to start something, you know, when we get back to school, because it's definitely easier in person. But when we get back to school, let's start a podcast for sure. We can do it together. You know, we can talk about whatever you want to talk about. And it should be a... Um 
relatively fun and carefree podcast. So I'm excited. I'm excited. I'm excited that kids are excited. I'm excited that, you know, things are starting to pick up and I'm starting to create more content and I'm starting to figure out what content's meaningful for kids. And I think that's the, the hardest part that I've had the challenge with is trying to create things that kids connect with and that kids relate to. That being said, please follow me on, you can follow me on Twitter, tweet me, let me know what you think. Let me know if you like the podcast. Let me know if you have any questions that you want me to answer. I want to do a Q and a session pretty soon. I want to start interviewing people. Eventually I'm going to start doing interviews and interviewing people. I think we're going to start with some teachers and interview them and figure out where they, uh, what their, their life was before teaching. And then I want to branch out and start interviewing people in the industries and uh, figure out what their life was and how they got there, what their journey was. And I really want it to be student driven. So the questions you hear are going to be, yeah, my students are going to ask these questions or write these questions down for me to ask, but it's mainly going to be for everyone listening, what these journeys were and, and how you can actually go about getting to a particular job that you've had your heart set on. You can follow me on Twitter. It's underscore chip happens. You can follow me on TikTok. It's W U wood shop. You can follow me or subscribe to me on YouTube at California Con- or carp. You can follow me or subscribe to me on YouTube at California carpentry and construction. And my Instagram is W S H underscore woodshop. Hey guys, thank you so much for listening. I am constantly blown away by the support. I'm constantly blown away by the amount of comments I get from people who actually listen in real life. And I greatly appreciate you taking the time to listen to this. I hope you guys have a great rest of your day. If this is nighttime, hope you guys sleep well. I will catch you guys in the next episode. Thank you all. This has been an episode of the Chip Happens Podcast. Thank you all for listening, and I will catch you next week with another exciting episode.